Mary had a little man, man, man. Wow, wow. We believe that all men are created equal. To the magnificent mosaic that is America. A radio beacon to radio beacon. Changes come to America. Believe me. Help is on the way. Knock, knock. Who's there? Hey! It's a figment of your imagination. Randy Road Show. Turn up your mind. Joe Lieberman became a U.S. Senator in 1989. A centrist Democrat and ally of Bill Clinton, he delivered a searing rebuke of the president at the height of the Monica Lewinsky scandal. Such behavior is not just inappropriate. It is immoral. And it is harmful. Though Lieberman voted against impeaching Clinton, his criticism was part of why Al Gore chose him as his running mate in 2000, making him the first Jewish politician to run on a major party ticket. The duo narrowly lost to George W. Bush and Dick Cheney after the Supreme Court halted the Florida recount. In a 2012 Washington Post interview, he told me he tried not to dwell on it. I was raised in a family that taught me life is about today and tomorrow, not yesterday. Back in the Senate, Lieberman led the push to establish the Department of Homeland Security after 9-11 and to end the Pentagon's don't ask, don't tell policy. But he broke ranks with Democrats in supporting the Iraq war. The moment of truth has arrived for Saddam Hussein. Lieberman lost his 2006 Senate primary to an anti-war candidate, but ran instead as an independent and held on to his seat. Then, just eight years after running to be the Democratic VP, Lieberman endorsed longtime friend John McCain's 2008 Republican presidential bid. I'm here to support John McCain because country matters more than party. Lieberman retired from the Senate in 2012, roughly 50 years after first stepping 50. into the chamber as an intern. America <laughs> remains a land of dreams and a nation of dreamers. And as long as that is so, I know that our best days as a country are still ahead of us. Lieberman remained politically active, helping to lead a centrist group called No Labels, which ah. is floating an independent ticket for the 2024 presidential race. He forged tight relationships, not just with Senator McCain, but also Republican Senator Lindsey Graham. They were known, you may recall, as the Three Amigos. In a statement, Graham said in part, quote, the good news he is in the hands of the loving God. The bad news, John McCain is giving him an earful about how screwed up things are. Uh -huh. Graham signed the statement, quote, from the last amigo. Uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. So uh, Joe Lieberman died, and that will come as a surprise to people who say he was still alive. Yes, he, uh, he was. He was still alive. He was 82 years old. Uh, he worked at a law firm that represented Donald Trump. He also uh, was responsible for the no labels, uh, you know, uh, uh, growth. Um, you know, l l let me put it this way. You he he was like the Kristen cinema of the aughts, okay? That's what Joel Lieberman was like. Like, while Kristen cinema, you know, was um, kind of in, uh, infuriating, and Joe Manchin was sort of um, bizarre, uh, Joel Lieberman was merely annoying, right? I mean, he started this whole uh, thing where you're a Democrat, you caucus with the Democrats, but you vote with the Republicans, and you vote with the Republicans on the Iraq war. You see, and this is what happened when Joel Lieberman uh, actually started supporting the Iraq war uh, when uh, Bush was president. The Democrats, like me, um, actually turned our backs. Now, we were already in the turning phase of our lives uh, with regard to Joe Lieberman ahead of 2003 because in 2000, yeah, when I was voting for president in Palm Beach County, like every uh, person in Palm Beach County did that year, um, the choice was Bush v. Gore, right? And um, <laughs> so it was Gore-Lieberman. That was the Democratic ticket. Now, because uh, in 2000, I was just a local broadcaster in Palm Beach County, basically. I worked on WJNO. It was a local Palm Beach radio station. It covered uh, most of Palm Beach and a tiny little sliver of Fort Lauderdale. And so as far as a media list that a presidential campaign might have, I would say I was on the C-plus list, okay? 
Now, why would I say not on the D list? Well, because I had already, um, you know, inserted myself into a very Republican bastion, uh, which was not just, uh, you know, Palm Beach County, but it was also a company that was uh, syndicating Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity and Glenn Beck and uh, real crazy people. And so somehow uh, I won hearts and minds in that company. Um, and they said, well, we need a token. Might as well make it her. She's likable. We like her. She's easy. She doesn't uh, bitch. She doesn't whine. She doesn't moan. She'll just go. And she'll do four hours a day is what she'll do. So that's how I wormed my way into, right? Make a long story short, the 2000 election comes around. I'm on the C list because I've, I've uh, demonstrated that I will do interviews with uh, various Democratic, uh, you know, uh, candidates and Congress members and that I follow the rules, meaning they can do their talking points uh -huh. on my show. I will tolerate it. Now, those days are long ass gone. That was like 24 years ago. OK, but back then when you wanted to uh, actually prove your bona fides, as they say, in democratic politics, you had to allow them to come on your show. And I mean, congressmen, senators and just speak to you in talking points, which was so offensive to me personally. <laughs> But I had to do it. Well, when you're a C plus, when you're on the C plus uh, media list, what you get during the presidential election, you don't get the candidate. No, you don't get Al Gore, who I was madly in love with and still am to this minute. I actually got to meet him as an adult person way later after I was nationally syndicated. And he's lovely. He was wonderful to me. And so was uh, his wife at the time. OK, just say. Uh, but I did not qualify to speak to the candidate back then. I did not qualify to speak to the vice presidential candidate back then, who would have been Joe Lieberman. But I did manage to get on the list for a phone call on election day eve, day before the election, with Joe Lieberman's wife. That's the level I was at, okay? Joe Lieberman's wife. I got to interview Hadassah. And Hadassah wanted us to call her. So I had her cell phone number, okay? She called in. Uh, I, we called her. She, she you know, uh, went on the show. And she was talking about the campaign trail. Perfectly nice person. But she was talking about the campaign trail, and she was complaining about porta potties This was my political interview, okay? This was my, ahead of a gigantic presidential election, OK, between, uh, you know, uh, right after the Clinton years were over and, and Gore was going to be the next president. You know, this is what I'm talking about on the and, you know, listen, I didn't want to take it out on her or whatever. So I was very uh, patient and let her bitch about the porta potties. OK, next day, election day. I go to vote. Something is so horribly wrong with the ballot. It's a paper ballot. It's called the butterfly ballot. And it's. A machine, it's a, it's a little, I have one, I should have brought it in today. It's a handheld uh, machine, it was on a snack tray, because that's how we vote in uh, Florida, we vote on snack trays so that the, uh, you know, old people will feel comfortable, that, you know, they're, they're at a familiar location, the snack tray. Anyway, it, this thing was a two-sided, uh, sort of a booklet, and in the spine, where the spine of the book would be, this booklet, was the holes that you had to take a stylus, like a, it looked like a pen, but it had a point, and you had to punch the hole next to the candidate that you wish to uh, choose. Well, the holes on the ballot were not aligned. And the names on the ballot made no sense. On the left side of the ballot was um, like Pat Buchanan. And on the right side of the ballot was George Bush. And then on the left side of the ballot was Al Gore and Joe Lieberman. And on the right side of the ballot was, you know, some independent candidate. I remember I came to work that day and I said out loud, oh my God, I think I just voted for Pat Buchanan. Ha ha, you know, no, the phone lines lit up. Everyone in Palm Beach County had the same freaking reaction to this ballot. No one was sure that they voted for Gore. No one was sure that they didn't vote for Pat Buchanan. And if you were an Al Gore, Joe Lieberman voter, trust me, Pat Buchanan was nowhere in your choice list. All things Randy at RandyRhodes.com. Go, go for launch. Speaking truth to power, the Randy Rhodes Show. 
So, okay, so it's election day now, right? And I say, oh my God, I think I just voted for Pat Buchanan. And the whole freaking phone line, the whole bank of, the, of phones uh, just light up. And everyone is telling me this. Everyone is calling and going, Randy, I think I just voted for Pat Buchanan. Oh my God, I think I did too. I did too. Uh, what was with that ballot? The, did your holes line up? No, the holes didn't line up. I don't know. So I had Hadassah's phone number because she wanted us to call her for the, uh, you know, uh, porta potty uh, call where she bitched about being on the campaign trail for about uh, 10 minutes. That's all you get, right? Okay, and so I, I call her, you know, I wait for the break and I call her up because you can't, you know, there, there, there were laws put in place where you can't just call somebody uh, and not let them know that they're going to be on the air. Do you know what I'm saying? So uh, all that had happened because before that, when we were when we were first coming up in this here uh, talk radio scene in this in this uh, particular uh, environment, we were allowed to prank call anybody. We could call, a- and we used to play those tapes. They were hysterical. I mean, th- this is why. And that show back then was you know flat out entertainment for me. It got political when I went up to uh, Palm Beach because that's what they wanted. So uh, you know that's when uh, you know it started being that anyway. I called her up and I said, listen, I need to speak to Joe. I need to speak. Could you please put him on the phone? And she's like, no, no, it's election day. But I go, listen, I just voted in Palm Beach County and I'm live on the air. She goes, am I on the air? No, no, I'm calling you, you know, I'm being, uh, you know, considerate and, and polite and I'm following the law. But uh, I need to tell him what everyone is telling me. Hold on. So she puts him on the phone and I tell him. Uh, you need to come on the air with me, and you need to come on the air with me right now. Something is wrong in Palm Beach County. And he says, uh, you know, he'll go on the air, but when we get, uh, you know, uh, through the commercial break, I had like seconds, right, seconds, uh, to, and then we went right to his phone call, and I tell him exactly what's going on. You know what he said? It'll be fine. It'll be all right. Now, this was offensive for many reasons. <laughs> Most of them are now historically documented facts about what happened in the next 36 days in Palm Beach County. Yes. So I don't think I need to uh, go any further with the story, but if people weren't alive back then <laughs> or don't remember or didn't vote in the in 2000 because, you know, you're only, what, uh, 30 years old now or 35 years old now, trust me, it was a hectic time. 36 days it took for the Florida State Supreme Court to hear a case about, uh, you know, uh, this ballot and about how the, the election was so tight that while the Gore-Lieberman campaign had won the popular vote, this is going to sound familiar because, you know, this happens now all the time. The Gore-Lieberman campaign had won the popular vote by about a half a million votes, but they didn't win the Electoral College because Florida was still counting, was still up for grabs. They had to go through each and every paper ballot and figure out what people meant to vote for when they stuck their stylus into this paper ballot. And what the stylus, what this uh, um, pen-like implement was supposed to be doing when you chose was supposed to be knocking out a piece of paper underneath the uh, booklet. And the piece of paper had a little square for a round hole, hello, and that was called a chad. (laughs) And so now you had people, uh, you know, uh, poll workers going through all of the ballots by hand in Palm Beach County, in Broward County, and in Miami, who all used this crazy butterfly ballot to vote. And these are the Democratic strongholds uh, voting of uh, Florida, okay? And so now they're counting uh, ballots by hand, and they're looking at chads. Now, if a chad was partially kind of, you know, selected but not quite pushed through, that was called a pregnant chad, where it looked like, you know, a, a belly. It looked like a round, beautiful belly. And so that was a pregnant chat. Then you had people who pushed it through, but it was still hanging on by a thread. It was still hanging, hadn't been fully, uh, the, 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 the operation hadn't been fully executed. And that was called a hanging chad. And they had to go through all these ballots. And days were going by and days were going by. 
and finally uh they there were there were uh, the, the the bush campaign was challenging the recount i mean it was just it was illegal and the thing was everyone involved was a lawyer okay lieberman went to yale okay you would think that they would be able to so the florida state supreme court and up until this moment in time in 2000 I believed, and you know I still do, but I believed that states had the right to choose the manner in which the electors would be selected. You know why I believed that? Because that's what it says in the Constitution, and I believed it. And you know who else believed it? The Florida Supreme Court believed it. Yes, they did. The Florida Supreme Court felt that running the election was the job of the state and that they were the proper venue to hear the case. And they said to Florida, keep counting. You do what you have to do to get to the accurate number of votes cast for each candidate's uh, campaign, for each candidate's uh, particular uh, slate of electors. You go ahead and you do it. So Florida State Supreme Court, wait, well, the Bush campaign was like, we're taking it to the United States Supreme Court. Well, why would you take it to the federal court? The federal court has no role to play in the state's election and the running of the state's election. Sound familiar? And so uh, it, it took a very heavy lift from a bunch of uh, very scheming, uh, you know, uh, Bush attorneys to actually get this to the federal, uh, you know, United States Supreme Court, who ruled you have to stop counting. Seriously. In their infinite wisdom, they decided you have to stop counting. Florida cannot continue to count votes. And at that point, on that day, when Florida was told to stop counting votes, the difference between the Gore-Lieberman ticket and the Bush ticket was 535 votes. And that's how we got George Bush as president of the United States. And then Lieberman just refused to, you know, I mean, I kept telling, he just, he didn't want to, he didn't want to challenge, he didn't want to get involved, he didn't, nothing. Uh, and so, you know, when people yell at us and say, oh, you, we, we always, uh, you know, uh, suggest that elections weren't fairly won. I'm like, really? No, we do the right thing. We go to courts and we go to courts that are in charge of the state's election and when the state's election is ruled to, you know, be free and fair and you have to keep on going, we live with that. But people actually go to the feds and to get a different decision. And because they are the feds, that's the last word. So I was very upset with Joe at that point. Then in 2003, when uh, George W. was telling the big lie about weapons of mass destruction, Lieberman stood up and supported him. And I couldn't shake the feeling that there was some sort of an inside agreement on the part of that particular uh, candidate, I don't, I don't know how else to say, vice presidential candidate, to just say, okay, we're not going to fight you anymore. We're not going to fight you. You just, uh, you know, you, you're now president. So he, he was really the Kristen Cinema of his day. <laughs> To speak to Randy, call 561-270-3844. 561-270-3844. All right, it is uh, Thursday in the second week, the last week, of the Free Speech TV Spring Pledge Drive. And today is a double match day. Today, if you uh, decided that you wanted to do $100, your $100 would be matched by a frontline funder. And that frontline funder would put up the exact same amount, $100. So your $100 is actually received by Free Speech TV as $200. And it goes up to $10,000 on the match. This is a great day to be a big dollar contributor. It really is. Uh, it is a great day to do $500 so that the $500 becomes 1000 and on and on it goes because that is what these frontline funders will do for us because they believe so sincerely in our mission of giving people independent, non-commercial, non-political, uh, uh, in, 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 influenced, opinions and facts so they step up to the plate and they uh, literally pull out their dollars and they match your dollars to theirs so that we can do shorter pledge drives which we are so grateful for as hosts 
uh, but also so that we can do um, pledge drives uh, that are just quarterly now. And, and, and it's a wonderful, wonderful thing that they do. So thank you uh, very much to our frontline funders and to everyone who will donate today. Just know that your dollar will be matched dollar for dollar up to 10 grand. So call 877-378-8669 and make your donation that way. Or you see that QR code on the screen right there. You can hold your phone up to that and it'll take you to freespeech.org and you can do it that way. Or you could just type in freespeech.org or you can use your phone to text just put the letters FSTV in and then text it to 44321 or actually dial 44321 and put in FSTV and we will send you a secure link. And on that secure link, you can make a one-time donation. You can do a recurring so that it'll be monthly. If you don't feel like you want to do monthly or you do, but then next month you say, I really, uh, I can't, uh, I'm not comfortable this month. No worries. Just go back to that link and turn it off. It is really that simple. So uh, thank you very much for your support. Donate now by uh, texting FSTV to 44321 or any of the other ways that uh, we accept donations. Thank you. Thank you again. So um, anyway, in 2003, Lieberman stood on the uh, Senate floor and he proclaimed that he was for the Iraq invasion. And I mean, I was such an anti-war um, demonstrator. I mean, I was physically demonstrating. We had gone uh, to, and I, I did this on my own dime. We had gone to um, the, the uh, George Bush's house, you know, his ranch, and uh, laid in the ditch in front of this house for days, okay, for days on end, protesting this war. In fact, I, I don't know, for, for those of you who listen on, uh, you know, uh, those of us, uh, you can't, it's not on free speech, but if you're listening in other ways, you may hear at the top of the hour show uh, by uh, Brad Blog with uh, Brad and Desi. They do uh, climate, uh, you know, climate reports. They're, they're very much into uh, environmentalism. The Green News Report. Yes, the Green News Report. Uh, that is when I first met Brad from the Brad blog and and he wasn't uh, on the air at all he was just uh, a reporter and he was just uh, very uh, anti-war and so that's when we first became friends that's how long I know Brad okay and uh, we were we were down there at uh, Bush's house uh, we anyway Lafayette Square Park we slept in Lafayette Square Park I mean it, it, we did everything we knew how to do uh, to let our party know that we were not supportive of an invasion of an unarmed nation. And we knew Iraq had no weapons of mass destruction. You know how we knew? Because that's when I dug in and started actually going out and finding people who worked at UNSCUM, who worked at the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, and the United Nations weapons inspectors, okay? And we would have them come on our show and tell us what they were finding there on the ground. And they weren't finding anything. And yet, it was all over that there were weapons of mass destruction. In fact, we had, uh, what did they call it? Um, the Full Ginsburg, okay? We had uh, Sunday shows where every single person inside the Bush administration would be on every single Sunday show. Every single one of them, from Meet the Press to State of the Union to, you know, uh, uh, Meet My Face to Eat My Face to Face the Nation to Backward, you know. I mean, like every single show. And they would sit there and they would speak in talking points. Talking points were a thing. It was a bad thing. Back in the day, I mean, that's all anybody would do was read off of their little piece of paper. And it was really offensive. I mean, really really offensive but anyway they all went on these shows and uh back then the media was uh, not challenging anybody they just wanted the bookings you know uh and so people were mushroom cloud we don't want the smoking gun to be a mushroom cloud dick cheney we don't want the smoking gun to be a mushroom cloud and all of them every single one of them, down to a man mushroom cloud mushroom cloud there was no mushroom cloud. They weren't nuclear. They had no nuclear weapons. They had no anthrax. They didn't have mobile laboratories that were, you know, and the, the stories were getting weirder and wilder as, uh, you know, they started to realize it was pushback against this war. It's only 20 years later, and we just got out of there. Isn't that special? So I guess we know who was right and who was wrong. Say. But it was so contentious with some people in the Democratic Party that their party was so anti-war because the war was bogus. The war was bull crap. 
the war was a war of choice. It wasn't a war of necessity, and all wars should be that. I mean, you shouldn't have to explain to somebody why you're invading Iraq. No one should need the explanation. It should be self-evident. It should be apparent to everyone. Like 9-11, we knew we were attacked, okay? We understood that planes, four of them, were making U-turns in the sky for hours, for hours. And somebody, somebody failed to keep us safe that day. Do you know what I mean? And it was getting very self-evident. People were, were getting very hip to the fact that this was some of the most secure airspace New York City, uh, Washington, D.C., over the Pentagon, for God's sake? You're telling me that wasn't restricted air and that we didn't have the ability to... And people were livid about that. And they needed to distract and they needed to find something that could rally the country. And so Iraq, they, they, you know, uh, Saddam Hussein. Because we had had a, a, a hundred-day war with him prior because he invaded Kuwait. And in a hundred days... That's how, you know, serious a, a, a challenger he was. In 100 days, we could tell him, you know, go get the hell out of Kuwait. And he did. Lieberman was so upset about his party not supporting his idea of what foreign policy actually entails and requires. And you know what was interesting is he was, uh, you know, very pro-invading Iran, too. I mean, he, hated, he was one of those that really wanted to bomb Iran. And even if you were trying to talk about it in a sensible way and you were saying, listen, if Iraq, if you attack Iraq, Iran wins. Iran will become stronger. This, they, they fought each other for nine years. Why are you taking their natural enemy out of the picture? Why are you taking on Iran's fight for them? Why are you doing that? When it came time to uh, support and endorse Barack Obama, Joe Lieberman endorsed John McCain. That's why. This is the Randy Rhodes Show. To speak with Randy, dial 561-270-3844. That's 561-270-3844. So Joe Lieberman, who was a Democrat in Connecticut, a senator, uh, who was elected, what, four times, uh, actually starts running again, and uh, he's primaried. He's primaried by an, a, an anti-war Democrat. I believe it was Ned Lamont who went on to be governor of Connecticut. Uh, and Lieberman was so pissed at the Democratic Party that the Democratic Party actually was principled enough to say, no, we're voting for an anti-war candidate, even though you're so used to being the senator. Uh, this time, no. This time, no. And he became an independent and ran that way and won and won after his own party uh, said, no, we're, we're anti-war, okay? We've been in Lafayette Square Park. We've been screaming and yelling at the top of our lungs. We've been sleeping in ditches in Crawford, Texas. And no, we're not for invasion of an unarmed nation where we will be bogged down and doing a wonderful favor for Iran, by the way. Uh, that just makes no sense to anybody. Okay. So he runs as an independent after losing his primary. Uh-huh. It's so interesting how... Um, you know, when it's time for you to uh, actually, you know, give up your seat, you know, you had no problem uh, taking Al Gore's presidency a away from him. You, that was like an easy uh, call for you. But now you're going to lose your Senate seat. Well, I'll just leave the party. That's what I'll do. And I'll run as an independent. Well, you know, now Barack Obama is running for president and Joe Lieberman refuses to endorse him. Just won't do it. A historical candidate like that who wanted to give us uh, the first shot that we would have at health insurance, uh, getting rid of pre-existing conditions, uh, actually making health care uh, come with subsidies for people who couldn't afford health care. We had 47 million uninsured Americans. Fast forward 20 years later, you know how many uninsured Americans we have now? Seven, seven million. Still not great, but way better than 47 million. And, uh, you know, oh, no, he didn't, uh, you know, he wasn't uh, all about that. So... He actually came out and he endorsed Sarah Palin and John McCain over Obama and his friend Joe Biden, which is very interesting. Uh, when the vote came up for the ACA, now it took a really long time to get the ACA on the floor, okay? 
And the reason why it took so long is because uh, the Democrats, especially, wanted single-payer health care, meaning Medicare, okay? We wanted people to pay into a system, and then there would be a single payer of all claims, the government, just like Medicare. Medicare, they don't decide, uh, you know, what doctor you can go to. They don't decide, you know, anything about that. Unless you choose Medicare Advantage and you take yourself out of traditional Medicare, then you're putting yourself into typically an HMO where they're going to choose. But traditional Medicare, just keep it simple like that, okay? They don't choose your doctor. They, and the lies about it were just like so intense. And so it led to the Tea Party, which is now MAGA, okay? And so anybody that was against the single payer thing, we gave them a third option. Okay. The third option, the first option was uh, just, you know, the ACA, which it is now, where there's an exchange, you choose a private health uh, insurance plan. Uh, if you can't afford the premiums and you make a certain amount of money or less, you get a subsidy to help you buy it. It has worked for 40 million Americans. Okay. And if it wasn't for the ACA, I, I would probably be dead by now because back then, in, in, you know, I, I had cancer. And it was fine. I'm fine. It's been a lot of years later, like eight. Anyway, they said, okay, here's another place you could hang your hat. You're not for the full, uh, you know, single payer thing, the Medicare for all. How about a public option? How about you give people a choice? You know, choice is a good thing, right? You're a Democrat. We believe in choice. So how about you give them a choice? And the choice would be something like either you want to be fully insured by a private health insurance company and you pay uh, your premium, and that's that, you're done. Or you can choose Medicare for all. You can choose a public option. You can choose to pay a smaller premium and be enrolled in a single-payer plan like Medicare, where the single-payer would be the government. Not the choice, but just the payer. Like you have a single-payer for Social Security, too. It's the government. You have a single-payer for Medicare bills. It's the government, right? And they were able to get people into the socialist mode and screaming socialism and screaming it's taking over and we're going to be, they couldn't decide, was that communist fascism? Was it, uh, you know, socialist communism? What, you know, they couldn't, but, it, and when you pointed out that social security was pretty socialist and that the military was pretty socialist, meaning everybody gets the same United States military fighting to protect them, whether they could pay for it or not, regardless of your ability to pay, you get policing. Regardless of your ability to pay, you can't be turned away at a public hospital in the emergency room, right? Sort of socialism. Lieberman was the vote that said, no, we're not going to have a public option. He killed it. He killed it. In exchange, he gave his vote as the 60th vote for the ACA. But we could have had a public option, and we didn't get one. We just didn't. And that would have helped, I can't tell you how many people, especially during COVID, especially during a, a pandemic like that. But um, so, you know, Joe Lieberman was the Joe Manchin of his day. He was the Joe Manchin of his time. And Joe Manchin is pulling the same crap. And he went so far off of the uh, Democratic, uh, you know, uh, reservation, meaning our uh, ideas, our policies, our, uh, you know, problem solving, our uh, discussions about how to solve difficult problems. He went all the way to the right to the point where he left. He joined a law firm in New York. He actually, you know, he's the senator from Connecticut, but he was living in the Bronx when he uh, died yesterday because he was a lawyer at a Manhattan law firm. That law firm represented Donald Trump. Number one. Number two, he actually is responsible for Nancy Jacobson and her husband, okay, Mark Penn, and this whole fiesta bowl of, 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 of crazy called No Labels. Joe Lieberman is part of that. And so when you talk about Joe Manchin, you talk about Kristen Sinema, you talk about, you know, uh, this, this whole spoiler a candidacy that will pull votes from, uh, you know, they think it'll pull votes from, uh, you know, one party, one major party or the other. 
you know, instead of letting Americans just vote for, I mean, we only get two possible choices, two winners, you know, only two possibilities. And those are the two major parties. And it's sad and it's pathetic. But unless and until you're willing to get behind changing the Electoral College, which would be a heavy lift, and I would think a Yale Law School graduate might be up for such a challenge, especially when they're so disheartened by the two-party system, that they have to leave one of the two parties. You would think their life's work would be devoted to making it better for third parties, fourth parties, fifth parties, right? But oh no, they decide that they are going to raise money off of spoiler candidate, uh, candidates like RFK Jr., like Joe Manchin, perhaps, or, you know, one of the, uh, you know, uh, third parties of uh, yesteryear, the Ross Perot's, whatever. So, you know, I mean, it's just, it's, it's so interesting that, um, you know, a guy who was a senator for 24 years, a guy who, he wasn't really that old, he was 82 years old, uh, apparently he fell, which is horrible, because that, that happened to Howard, too, you know, Howard just, uh, and, and by the way, Howard and Joe, best friends, uh-huh. My Howard, Joe Lieberman, and his lovely wife, Adassa, were all very, very, very close because Howard was a lobbyist, and Joe Lieberman liked that about him, okay? And you know, I'll never forget, when I first started dating Howard, he was still a lobbyist. I made it my life's work to make him stop doing that. But I remember, uh, you know, I lived in Florida, Howard lived in D.C., and we were long distance dating at the beginning. And we got off, I, I got uh, to Washington, D.C., and we were coming back to Florida together. And we were at Reagan International, okay? And I think we were at baggage claim. Either we were, go I think we were arriving in Washington. I can't even remember which way we were going. But there was Joe and there was Hadassah standing at the airport. And we were all at baggage claim, okay? And, um, Joe and uh, Howard saw each other, and Joe was like, hey, Howard, how are... And then he saw me, and the blood drained from his weirdly, oddly shaped head. And he went, are you with her? And Howard said, yeah, we're dating. And I, I he just, he like turned and swiveled on his Gucci loafer and gave us the cold show. That's how despised a person I was in that world. And I wear that as a badge of honor. So, um, what, what, what are you supposed to say? Um, may his memory be a blessing, uh, something like that? Yeah, so Hadassah, sorry for your loss. May his memory be a blessing. <laughs> We believe that all men are created equal. To the magnificent mosaic that is America. From radio beacon to radio beacon. I have a dream today. Change has come to America. Believe me. Help is on the way. Knock, knock. Who's there? Hey. It's a figment of your imagination. Randy Rhodes Show. Turn up your mind. Victory is within reach. It's a few weeks away. Now we are told, this is it, last point. Now we are told, you can't do this. If you go into Rafah, you're going to have a humanitarian catastrophe. You're going to have, I don't know, 30,000 dead. 30,000. Civilian dead. Okay. That's not true. And speaking of Israel... <laughs> Yeah, I, I, so I, he's going into Rafa. I mean, he is determined. This man is an extremist. He is a right-wing lunatic, fringy guy who is going to make it Israel and Israel alone, alone in the world. This little sliver in the middle of the Middle East is going to be isolated and alone. He is literally pissing off the entire democratic world uh, by slaughtering people uh, in this manner that he has chosen to slaughter people. Now, like I said, when, when you go and you say war, you know, we're going to do what it should be self-evident. Why? I believe Israel uh, had a right to self-defense after it was attacked in this horrible, brutal manner by 2000 terrorists who actually came into their country over a wall and murdered people all day, all day, thousands. 
a thousand people, kidnapped 250 people, raped their way through a kibbutz, raped their way through a concert. I mean, come on. And it was really obvious. And the reason was for the whole world to see and anybody who argued with Israel's right to retaliate, there was something wrong with them. Truly. And they were expecting, I don't know, a different, uh, a different earth than the one we actually live on. But the way he responded, and what did we say at the beginning? We said, don't be stupid about it. Learn from us. Don't do what we did. It does, you know, but the Joe Liebermans, the Netanyahu's, these guys, they, they you know, rhymes, it, it sounds like Yahoo must be Yahoo. Must be right-wing extremism, truly. So let it not come from me. Let it come from somebody who actually is a, um, a foreign policy expert. Somebody who actually knows what is going on around the world at all times. Let's just throw it over to Fareed Zakaria for a brief moment, shall we? This is a fight that Bibi Netanyahu has almost brought upon himself. Mm. You almost wonder at some level whether he was spoiling for a fight. Because the Biden administration has, and most Israelis feel this way, has been more supportive of Israel in this conflict than virtually any previous administration has in Israel's other moments of crisis. True that. So the Biden administration has supported them militarily, materially, morally, but they have kept asking for certain concessions, you know, pay more attention to civilian casualties. That's a concession. Let humanitarian aid go through. Allow for temporary ceasefires so you can have more of that aid go through. And now this issue of Rafa, whether or not you really need to go through. And I think Bibi Netanyahu almost wants this fight. He has a very extreme uh, right-wing coalition. It sh it, he, he seems to be, you know, kind of zealously defending the, the, the hardline position in doing all this. Extremists. But by doing this, what he is doing is he's wrecking the trust that has built over decades between Israel and the United States. And what he's doing is creating a, 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 an idea that the United States can be pro-Israel without being pro-Bibi. Israel can be a close ally, but Bibi Netanyahu might not be a close ally. I swear to God, you know, when it comes from him, I, it sounds uh, all, uh, you know, well thought out. When it comes from me, people just curse me out. Do you know what I mean? But this is exactly what my argument has been all along, it, that, that it's not the problem with the state. It's a secular state, okay? It's not the problem with the people. It is a problem with this extreme right-wing Likud party. It is a problem with the ultra-Orthodox. It is a problem in the West Bank uh, of taking people's stuff, taking their land, taking their houses, shooting their children, just randomly doing these things because that is what the ultra-Orthodox Likud party, the, the, we played you the other day that, uh, that woman, okay, Mir, uh, uh, what's her name, Weiss, who, you know, uh, listen, they're the ones that are cleansing. They're cleansing us, okay? We're not doing to them, they're doing to us. Uh, no, you've been doing to them for a really stinking long time. And people have, you know, either turned a blind eye or said, listen, it's not our fight. You do you. Right. But now the whole world, the whole world is sickened by what you're doing to appease ultra orthodox right wing religious uh, zealots. It is no different than Christian right wing conservatism here. And it is no less racist than Christian white conservatism is here when it's over there. And it's all being sanctioned by their leader who is doing this to keep himself out of jail. Sound familiar? Play the race card. Just keep on creating chaos and death and destruction and contratops and letting people die. You know, we lost a million people during COVID, really, because we had the wrong leader at the wrong time. And this man was very busy telling us that it was a hoax and that there was no uh, shortage of PPE and that there were no shortages of toilet paper and that the store shelves weren't empty. Just don't believe your own lion eye. I mean, it's just an amazing thing. How many people had to die? How many people? And I just wonder if this right-wing lunacy is going to cause a number like that to happen over there. You know, I was just looking at uh, Ukraine, too. Ukraine is, uh, you know, a, a democracy in the middle of Europe that's been uh, the victim of a war of aggression by a psycho, by a right-wing lunatic, by a, 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 an autocrat by a, an oligarch, by a man who has complete and total control over the elections, complete and total control over the media, the state-run media, complete and total control over how people live their lives and what they think.
okay, and how they orient themselves in the world. And so these people have all of these same traits. They have all of these things in common. And what happens is a lot of people die. A lot of people die. And people just don't equate the death from the pandemic here (laughs) with, uh, you know, benign neglect or malignant neglect or having a really bad leader who thought it makes me look bad. Therefore, it's not happening. Are we going to see numbers like that? Over there, are we? Because I was looking at uh, the numbers in in Ukraine. You know, you got to give these people credit. Uh, Ukrainians are awesome. They are amazing. They are resilient. They are in, in innovative. They have no air power. You understand this? They don't have the F-15s. When are they going to get the damn F-15s? Well, according to Denmark and the Netherlands and Norway, uh, these are the countries that say that they're going to supply the F-15s to Ukraine, and they're going to do it this summer. But that they've been training the pilots. Uh, to handle this uh, very high-tech uh, piece of machinery, right? And so they say they're going to deliver them in, uh, this, uh, in the, during the summer, this summer. Vladimir Putin says today, if I see an F-15 in, uh, uh, in the sky, I'm shooting it down. I- I'm going to shoot it down. And I don't care if it's a U.S. Uh, pilot. And I don't care if it's a NATO. See, remember, Finland and and, uh, 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 Sweden are now NATO members, right? So if any of these planes come from uh, Finland or Sweden, you know, are delivered to Ukraine, well, then all of a sudden he's going to shoot them down. And maybe they had a Norwegian pilot or maybe they they had a uh, a, a, a Swedish pilot. Do you know? And start World War III. I mean, I don't know, but this right-wing extremism has got to be called out for what it is. It is a loser's path for people, for ordinary people to follow. I mean, he's still on the TV trying to sell you a a Bible. I mean, it's very sick. He literally plucked Lee Greenwood out of his, uh, you know, uh, sleepy little uh, house, his sleepy little life. Had one hit. And put him on Fox News saying, I got my autographed copy of the Lee Greenwood Bible from President Trump. It's got your name on it. Why is it autographed by him? Oh, because I licensed. How do you license the Bible? I mean, the fraud is just exceptional. It really is. But small people get hurt. That's who gets hurt. Look at Sam Bankman Freed, okay, today. You know, this guy ripped off every person that believed in him, every single cult member of uh, FTX, which was a platform, like so, uh, Truth Social, it was a trading platform for Bitcoin and, uh, you know, uh, Ether and, uh, you know, all these um, cryptocurrencies. He was stealing your money like left out. He stole $8 billion. Thanks, Randy, at RandyRhodes.com. Go, go for launch. Speaking truth to power, The Randy Rhodes Show. If one president isn't enough, how about three? Yes. And if you want a picture with all of them, get ready to write a check for $100,000 tonight. We understand the importance of the three of them being together. Obviously, this is going to be an important uh, important event. A star-studded event at Radio City Music Hall in New York, with tickets ranging from $225 to a half a million. The president has been on something of a campaign blitz, most recently in North Carolina this week. His re-election operation says it's already sitting on 155 million dollars in cash wow and it only goes up from there it's a disgrace what's happening <laughs> in our country beyond reacting to developments in his court cases this week former president trump has had a relatively light public schedule light but a new fox news poll offers him some good news he's five points up in a head-to-head match with biden And the lead remains consistent, even if you factor in third-party candidates like Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who just this week announced that his running mate would be progressive activist Nicole Shanahan. That may fuel concerns among many Democrats that a third-party bid would take a toll on Biden. You don't need significant support to throw an election to Donald Trump. Uh, We saw this play out in, in 2016. Now, though, the president's fundraising prowess is pretty impressive. I mean, he's got a huge campaign hall already. They're talking about this event tonight bringing in about $25 million. Oh, my God. $25 million in one night. But it is historic, I have to say. I mean, I would love to be there. I really would love to be there. But, uh, you know, uh, when they show you Radio City Music Hall, I worked in the building right next to it. Yeah. That's where the dark star is. And across the street from that building, that's Fox News. I mean, literally across the street at 6th Avenue right there. Anyway, that is Media Central. 
but um 225 i could do you could do a 225 maybe right you could do a 225 if you were really into politics the way that i am and you know see three presidents three 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 presidents and one you know radio city music hall appearance oh and it would be like my presidents, you know what I mean? Like mine, holy crap. I mean, that's the cherry on the cake of that uh, ticket, right? I mean, it's almost as good as seeing heart. It's almost, almost that good. But uh, no, it's better, <laughs> it's really unbelievable. Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, Joe Biden, I mean, all of it. But then the big ticket, you know what you get for your 100 grand? You know what you get? I think I think you may have to give 250, I'm not sure, $250,000. But Amy Leibowitz, who is, uh, you know, the world-renowned uh, photographer who takes pictures that capture your personality, you know, that show, like, uh, your, your, your soul to people because she sees you and she can capture you. Uh, she, she, wow. Uh, She's going to take the photo of some of the large donors with these three presidents to capture, uh, you know, that moment for you, for the low, low bargain base, my price of $250,000. But at least you're getting something. Or you could buy the Trump Bible. <laughs> you know, I, and I'm looking at the crazy. I really, the crazy is just, wow. There, there is so much crazy going on on the right. First of all, I don't even know if you heard about this or not. I'm going to tell it to you, though. You know who Matt Schlapp is. That's, uh, you know, uh, the part of the, the conservative uh, movement, right? Uh, Matt Schlapp was <laughs> accused of groping uninvited and, you know, like, I don't want to say mercilessly because I don't know that that's what I would characterize what he did. It might have been just drunkenly and, uh, you know, unwelcomed groping. I think that's how I would put it. A man. Hey Amen. This is uh, one of the conservative, uh, you know, uh, 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 pillars of society. Him and his wife, Mercedes Schlapp, hold themselves out as the perfect conservative couple, what every conservative should aspire to be. Uh, and it turns out that he's groping uh, male staffers drunk in a car. And this male staffer actually brought a lawsuit to uh, complain to Matt, who denied it vehemently over and over again, to make sure that Matt Schlapp got the message that we all know this happened, we all know it's true, and you're going to pay for this because you keep on making me feel like I'm crazy because you know you did this and you're denying it because it doesn't actually coincide with what you're selling to the American people with your anti-gay, anti-LGBT, everybody that likes, uh, you know, uh, uh, inclusiveness is somehow woke. And you're the wokest of the wokey ones in a closet. And so the guy sued. Well, a couple of weeks ago, it, it actually ended. The lawsuit came to a, um, you know, a sort of a whimpering end. And the PR stunt was designed so that it appeared like Matt Schlapp uh, just had the lawsuit dismissed because he didn't do anything. But it's not true. The way this lawsuit ended was Matt Schlapp agreed to pay the person he groped $480,000. That's a half a million dollars. Uh-huh. And again, there's no, uh, you know, no claim of, uh, you know, uh, a guilt, okay? This happened to Ken Paxton yesterday, too. Ken Paxton was given a nice out three weeks ahead of his trial, but his trial was a criminal trial uh, for securities fraud, okay? And he was told, pay the people back, pay almost $300,000, and we won't even make you plead guilty so you can continue to run for office and be the chief law enforcement officer for the great state of Texas, even though you're a securities fraudster, and you still got two more, uh, two more accounts against you, right? One where you'll lose your license to practice law because you put together a case where Texas wasn't even a party uh, to the Supreme Court to claim that, uh, you know, uh, there was fraud in the election. And now you need to face uh, the bar because you're probably, uh, you know, due for disbarment and uh, you're the attorney general of Texas, right? Oh, and you know who else? Eastman. Eastman today was recommended for disbarment. John Eastman uh, for the fake elector scam, right? And so John Eastman, for the fake elector scam, was uh, his hearing was in front of a judge, uh, you know, the, the, um, 
the bar association has a judge that sits and hears all the bar complaints and the uh, judge decided that uh, John Eastman really did qualify for and should be disbarred for the scam that he tried to pull over the American people by putting together lists of fake electors. And when John Eastman was deposed uh, the last time, we were able to see him invoke his Fifth Amendment privilege over and over and over again. Well, he did the same thing in this particular instance, but his lawyers actually said to the uh, panel, the Bar Association panel, hey, let's just skip this part where you actually make him testify because, um, you know, it'll just end up on MSNBC is what it is. It'll end up on, you know, Randy's show. It'll end up on everybody's show, you know, and and we don't really want him captured on videotape doing it. (laughs) They made him do it. And Chris Hayes actually showed it on MSNBC last night because these people are always in denial about their behavior, whether it's, you know, unwelcome groping of a male staffer while holding yourself out to be a holier-than-thou Christian values family man married to your beard or whatever. It's unbelievable, really. Call in, connect. To speak to Randy, call 561-270-3844. 561-270-3844. All right. So listen, everybody. It's Thursday, and uh, we only have like one more day for the Free Speech TV Spring Pledge Drive. Just one more day. Today is the match day. Today is a two for one. So today is a day where you could make your hundred dollars into two hundred dollars, two hundred and four hundred, a thousand into two thousand, and on and on it goes. Because the frontline funder is whatever you can do, they will match. And so if you did fifty dollars, we would get a hundred dollars from that pledge. And that is exactly the kind of support that Free Speech TV needs as we close out the spring Free Speech TV Pledge Drive. So please donate now by calling 877-378-8669. Support independent media. And, you know, listen, if you ever wondered, like, whether or not, uh, you know, uh, I I was in the tank for the party or whatever, I I just spent an hour telling you my my deep, dark secrets about the, uh, you know, Joe Lieberman uh, debacle, okay? No, there's no fear of favor. No, it's just uh, what it is. It is what it is. And uh, wherever it falls, that's where we call it, right? So if that's your thing and you really like it, uh, honest like that, then uh, just you could use the QR code there. Hold up your phone and it'll take you to freespeech.org. That is the website for Free Speech TV in Denver, Colorado. It is a not-for-profit. And you can make your dollar count twice. You can also text 44321. Put in the letters FSTV, and they will be uh, able to send you a very uh, nice, secure link uh, that you can use to make your donation that way. So thank you very much for uh, supporting independent media that does not bend a knee for anybody. Uh, Jim in New Mexico. Hello. Hello. Hi, Randy. Yeah, uh, Happy Friday. Thank you. It's Thursday, but okay. Oh, I know. I keep thinking it's. Friday because it's opening day baseball season, so I'm thinking. Oh, today oh, is today in. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's cool. that's cool. yeah, it's opening day baseball, so I'm ready to watch my Chicago Cubbies take on those frickin' Texas. Uh, <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, but, my, uh, my my TV is set to uh, you know for MLB, so it'll tell me you know that uh, the game. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my TV is set for MLB too, but of course we have to pay for that. But anyways, besides the point, uh, I'm willing to pay for it because I need to, yeah, I need to get my mind off of politics. So it's my escape I hear because you. I watch. Yeah, I mean, I watch Stephanie Miller all the way through Sonali, uh, all you guys. So right. I love all of you. That's wonderful. But Randy, uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Honey, and I appreciate the way you break things down. You did a great expose on Joe Lieberman and what he was. He might have been a great family man. He might have been a great man personally. But I tell you what, he didn't do the Democratic Party. He was in a a Republican uh, cloak. He was a a Democrat with a Republican cloak on. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, listen, his best friend was, uh, you know, the man I live with, but my, the man I live with was a high-powered, highfalutin lobbyist, okay? And <laughs> this was his friend. This was the group he, he ran around with, you know? I mean, it was all about yeah. it was all about the, the shekels, you know? Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah. you know, you just yeah. call it like you see it is what it is. And, uh, you know, it's sad that he died in a, in a miserable way by falling, you know. It just happened to Howard, you know. Howard fell into a table and uh, mm. literally shattered his, uh, like, a multitude of ribs. Had to have surgery and plate, uh, plates put in and all that. And I imagine that's what happened to Joe, too. But, you know, it's... Well, I'll tell you what, Randy. Howard is a lucky man to, yes. have, you, to have, have you take care of him because... I'm shit out of luck. And oh, you can't curse. Sorry, we have to dump that. Thank you. You didn't hear that, did you? No. All right. So um, he said. Uh, no, I was out grabbing another phone call. What did he say? He cursed. Oh, that's unfortunate. That's very unfortunate. So anyway, uh, I just wanted to let you know there were so many criminals uh, in the last segment, like uh, talking about John Eastman. This, this, this criminal uh, taking the fifth was not John Eastman. It was a different criminal taking the fifth <laughs> this one was jeffrey clark jeffrey clark everybody taking the fifth and being exposed on chris matthew's show now, the rest of the hearing didn't go chris hayes chris matthew yes i'm living in the 90s today that's uh, that's the problem now, the rest of the hearing didn't go any better for clark before he took the witness stand his lawyer tried to strike a deal with the board wherein he would receive questions ahead of time so that his client could avoid repeatedly invoking his Fifth Amendment rights. And he said he wanted to do so in order to avoid a very specific outcome. <laughs> there may be an elegant solution that takes into account the, the reasoning of the chair and Mr. Mr. Fox's valid concerns to make a record while avoiding us all being on MSNBC for no good reason. <laughs> Suffice it to say, that ploy did not work. No. So, advice of counsel, Mr. Fox, I will take the fifth on that. I will invoke the fifth as to, I will invoke executive privilege, uh, law enforcement privilege, deliberative process privilege, and attorney client privilege. The Fifth Amendment privilege at this time. The Fifth Amendment privilege at this time. The Fifth Amendment <laughs> privilege at this time. The Fifth Amendment privilege at this time. The ah. Fifth Amendment at this time. Oh, my God. And that guy was almost our uh, Attorney General of the United States of America. Do you know that? I mean, you thought Bill Barr was bad. You thought you know, Jeff Sessions was a, a weird, uh, you know, sort of a pick. But this guy, Jeffrey Clark, they were going to install him. They were going to put him in as the Attorney General of the United States to overturn the results of the election. Because I, I, Bill Barr wasn't having any of it. That was his, his line. Yeah, Bill Barr will let Russia interfere in our elections. Yeah, Bill Barr will say that, you know, uh, there was nothing in the Mueller report. And then, you know, wait three weeks, release it, then release what he released was redacted so no one could make heads or tails out of what it actually said and found. And now it's happening all over again, you know. Russia is uh, inserting itself all over our social media uh, in this election, too, because we didn't nip it in the bud. Because we had an attorney general like Bill Barr. But even Bill Barr had a red line, wouldn't say an election was stolen, wouldn't do that kind of damage to democracy. He would do other kind of damage to democracy. Like he would say, yes, they spied on, uh, you know, uh, uh, John Donald John Trump. They spied on him. I think spying did occur. Remember that? I think spying did occur. There was no spying. There was no proof of spying. There was no spying. Spying did not happen. Oh, and by the way, uh, Hunter Biden did not uh, do anything wrong either. <laughs> Do you know Lev Parnas? He keeps releasing more and more of his uh, tapes that he made on his phone. And he released a tape today that is just, it's, it's stunning if you follow that story. Uh, if you don't, it won't, won't really uh, make so much sense. But it's a phone call where Lev Parnas is sitting at a conference table in a conference room with Rudy Giuliani. And they're on the phone with the prosecutor that um, they say was fired to prevent an investigation into Burisma from occurring, Victor Shokin. It's exactly the opposite. Victor Shokin was fired because he was not investigating Burisma. But anyway, they're on the phone, and Lev Parnas is recording it, and Rudy Giuliani says to Victor Shokin, so, so, um, you were fired, right? Well, was there actually any money exchanged was there bribes going on it was did you you know was anything like that on and he said no oops
Lev Parnas has put that out on Twitter for everyone to see and hear. There was no payment. There was no, he just was corrupt, period. This is the Randy Rhodes Show. Hey, to speak with Randy, dial 561-270-3844. That's 561-270-3844. Well, I think it's what we've all known all along. Obama is running the country. Obama is having his uh, third term, so to speak. And everyone's always known that. And of course, he's coming out as the leader of the Democrat Party because he always has been the leader of the Democrat Party. Joe Biden is just a puppet dangling on the (laughs) strings doing what Obama wants him to do. I think Joe Biden's been in, uh, what, 18 states or something like that, something crazy like that. He's he's running like this very vigorous, uh, you know, earning your vote sort of a uh, presidential candidacy, right, a presidential, um, you know, uh, campaign. And Donald Trump is, uh, you know, sitting in his uh, golf club somewhere, texting in all caps about Joe Budden. No, I'm not kidding. I'm not running to terminate the ACA as crooked Joe Budden disinformates and misinformates all the time. I'm running, small letters, to capitalize Close the border. Stop inflation. How are you going to stop inflation? What what are you going to stop spending your uh, money? Is that that what you're going to do to stop inflation? I mean, it's so sick and twisted that all this man does is misspell words, uh, torture the English language, and post it on a fraudulent bargain basement reasonable facsimile of Twitter called Truth Social takes that thing public when it's really losing $50 million a year and has less than a million users and then has it valued, which is what he's on trial for, at a whopping, what, $3 billion? Right in front of your face and then selling you $60 Bibles on top of it. Holy crap, man. It's just like, and there's, uh, you know, Marjorie Jewish Space Lasers, uh, you know, uh, on Steve Bannon, uh, Mr. White Supremacy, uh, you know, under the guise of being a uh, Opus Dei Catholic, uh, you know, interviewing her about how, Really, Obama is in charge. Obama's running the country. You know, I, I, Miss Jewish Space Laser is also part of uh, spreading conspiracy theories about the bridge d- disaster that just happened in uh, uh, Baltimore. True. You, I, I don't think, you know, for, for those of us who really don't spend a whole lot of time on social media, I find myself spending less and less and less time on it. Obviously, I'm throttled and blocked and, you know, things are never going to go my way unless I actually pay or do, uh, you know, say what they want. Uh, It's never going to happen. It just never is. And uh, this is not anything I'm a a stranger to. Okay, but uh, here's Joy Reid, who does have the big platform now, uh, pointing out, you know, all this, uh, you know, all these conspiracy theories. And how, at their very bottom, they're all racist, like Jewish space laser lady. It has been a grab bag of right-wing grievances, barely coded racism, and flat-out lies. Noted Jewish space lasers and QAnon conspiracist Marjorie Taylor Greene suggested the disaster was the result of an intentional attack, (laughs) perhaps by the space lasers. (laughs) But the most idiotic and racist theories had to do with their newest boogeyman, Diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI. A Republican congressional candidate in Florida tweeted that DEI did this. (laughs) And a right-wing blue check account that's been boosted by Elon Musk in the past just blew straight past the dog whistling, tweeting to its 276,000 followers, quote, Baltimore's DEI mayor commenting on the collapsed Francis Scott Key Bridge. It's going to get so, so much worse. Prepare accordingly. The post included a clip of Baltimore's what? black mayor, Brandon Scott. I, I cannot believe I have to say this. Brandon Scott was elected with 70 percent of the vote in 2020 in a city that is 61 percent black. So by right wing logic, a diversity hire would have been a white man. 
which of course is what they want. Only the white Christian men may have the things. May have the things. And at this point, it's evident what they mean by DEI, right? Okay, it means black people. Yes. It's the reason the right complained about critical race theory. It's not fashionable to be openly racist anymore in America, unlike what they call the good old days. So <laughs> referring to a black mayor as a DEI mayor gets the point across, right? So fellas, why not just say what you mean? You can't stand black people. We get it. You've been heard. Good for you, Joy. That was well done. Yeah, that was that was well done. Wow, spitting hot fire. That spitting was spitting hot fire with a little bit of underlying uh, comedic, uh, you know, uh, 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 affection. I mean, it was uh, well done. That was beautiful. Only the white people can have the things. <laughs> But she's right. In Baltimore, where it's 61% black, a diversity hire would be a doughy white guy. <laughs> and then uh, she hosted the mayor of Baltimore, who was elected with 70% of the vote. Okay? Uh, and he, 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 he was reacting to this accusation uh, that he was a DEI hire. I know, and we all know, and you know very well, that black men and young black men in particular have been the boogeyman for those who are racist and think that only uh, uh, straight, wealthy white men should have a saying anything. We've been the boogeyman from them since the first day they brought us to this country. And what they mean by DAI, in my opinion, is duly elected incumbent. Uh, <laughs> we know what they want to say, uh, but they don't have the courage to say the N-word. And the fact that I don't uh, believe in their uh, untruthful and wrong ideology, and I am very proud of, proud of my heritage and who I am and where I come from, scares them. Uh, because me being at my position means that their way of thinking, their way of life of being comfortable and suffering and while everyone else suffers is going to be at risk. And they should be afraid because that's my purpose in life. Oh, I love it. <laughs> I love it. Out of many, one, everybody. That's all I can say. You know, here we are. You know, we, we love to say, oh, America is a melting pot. One, it's convenient. I have never believed we we're a melting pot. I've always believed we were somewhat of a salad somewhat of a salad we have uh, you know very hot tomatoes and uh, we have some radishes in there uh but we don't exactly meld together the way you would hope it hasn't happened yet we all you know who 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 you know really don't want the drama anymore most of us just want peace and quiet and a, a, a somewhat of an organized government somewhat of a thoughtful set of policies from our government in exchange, we will pay our taxes, but everybody has to pay their taxes. Everybody has to pay their fair share. This is what we work for, this is what we hope for. Uh, and of course, one day we hope for a set of policies that will take the drama out, that will take the racism and put it on a back burner for a little while more uh, and create some sort of a melting pot. We have not gotten there. We have not gotten there. And you can see that when there is a terrible, horrific tragedy, a bridge literally falls down like a Lego set, like a bad erector set, okay? And the reaction of the right-wing lunatics in this country is not to say, how can we help? Or what do you need from us? Do you need uh, uh, heavy equipment? Do you need divers? Do you need Coast Guard personnel? What do you need? What can we give you? What, can we, what, what do we have that will benefit you in your time of need? No. Their thing is to blame. Their thing is to point at somebody, say they're to blame, and make you afraid of them. That's all they got. They have nothing more to offer you. And they keep on trotting this crap out. And I think less and less people are falling for it these days, as evidenced by the poor fundraising that's going on for the Republican Party. The really bad, I mean, where are his rallies? Are you going to vote for a guy who doesn't entertain you on top of it? I thought that was the bargain he made. You give him money for lame things like uh, water, <laughs> and he gives you a rally. He's not even out there doing the rally. He's, he's, he's sitting at home, uh, you know, typing crap in capital letters and getting the president's name wrong to the point where Joe Budden actually trended on Twitter. And if you check my Twitter feed, you'll see what I did to this uh, particular posting of his. 
I think it may be only a matter of time before he's no longer able to give one of those entertaining rallies. Physically, <laughs> mentally, just not up to it. We're at the point where all this is anymore is performance art. I mean, this doesn't even have any entertainment value in it. It's just some guy, you know, with an ego big enough to go out there and, uh, you know, think that he's uh, doing something that's valuable to, uh, you know, make you laugh or feel good for an hour. No, it's just it's a uh, bad, bad uh, performance art. Like, really bad. Joe Budden, the grest American citizens. The grest. You're the grestest. America. And MAGA's no longer MAGA. It's MAPA. He, he went from make America great to make America pray again. Because he's selling, he's hawking, he's, he's, he's shilling a Bible. Oh, my God. 